I think we're live, guys. Um, welcome, welcome to Fearless Flight Live. Um, this is the crew edition. And with me tonight is our lovely flight attendant, Diane. Hi, Diane. Hi. <laughs> and of course, Captain Eric. Hey, Captain Eric, how are you? Hi, you guys. Um, so every third Tuesday of the month, at least that's the schedule that we're following. We have our crew edition where um, the three of us come and talk about aviation news and uh, questions that we're getting um, that we don't usually get to during our regular show. So if you're just tuning in, uh, Fearless Flight Live, our weekly live show where if you're afraid to fly or you know somebody who's afraid to fly, um, hopefully finds uh, inspiring and supportive information to help you get over your fear of flying. So um, let me just um, say this. There's a lot of talk about um, the 737 MAX 9. Um, for those of you who don't know, that is the one um, where the door, uh, yeah, just disappeared mid-flight. <laughs> and um, uh, I have a post. I just want to read um, a short paragraph from one of our Birds of a Feather uh, members. And uh, let me just pull this up because this is really amazing. And um, this is from Miguel. And Miguel says, hi, everyone. I just got off uh, 737 MAX 9. With all the bad news surrounding this plane, I had to block it all out and stay focused on my mission to keep going. And uh, that's in all caps, by the way. <laughs> um, he said, FAA cleared the plane and Boeing instituted a fix. And, and I'm here in Mexico City having the time of my life. Three years ago, this would not have been possible. I have packed my life with flights, flights, and more flights. <laughs> the only <laughs> way to overcome this is to fly. So my advice is stay off negative news, stay off Tubri, and we talked about Tubri um, last week, um, stay engaged here, so that's the Bird of a Feather Facebook group, as well as our weekly live show, and just keep going. I'll be uploading videos um, soon of my flight, and please uh, consider watching as I'm doing this to support you. We all got this. And I just want to say this is super inspiring and um, lots and lots of people uh, like, like the post um, because it really speaks to the heart of what fear of flying and how you can overcome it is all about. It's, it's not about the plane, whether it's the Max 9 or, you know, um, some other plane. It's really about the pain in your brain. And that is the key. Um, and if you don't believe us, watch, I think two weeks ago, we did uh, Arnold with a show with Arnold Barnett, um, an MIT professor and statistician. And um, if you are an American and watching this, you have a better chance to become the next president. So then uh, be injured or die in a, in a plane crash. So that's pretty crazy. Not but, only, I hate to interrupt you, but not only become the president, but what else? And win an Olympic gold medal. At the, the same the, time. At the same time. <laughs> win the gold medal and be elected president. You have a better chance of doing that than dying in a plane crash. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sounds like the odds are pretty good. Sounds like sounds like the odds are pretty good. Okay. However, and yeah. I want to lead into what you're gonna talk to us about, Captain Eric, tonight. Um not everything always works exactly as planned. And what you're going to be talking about um, today is missed approaches and go-arounds. So 
what are they and um, what could you tell us about those things? And let me know when you want to slide up there. Okay. So we never talk about this stuff with you guys. And I just wanted to bring it up because you think of lots of stuff we don't think of. So I just wanted to go over this quickly to alleviate any doubt in your mind or possibly answer questions. And and the theoretical is here, I, I heard from a, a person who was afraid to fly and it's funny you guys get out there and are doing stuff and go, oh boy, I haven't I haven't experienced a go around or something forever. And they'll be off on a flight and it happens. And that is when you've conquered all your fears and got on the airplane and you're almost to the destination, you can see the terminal literally from the airplane windows and the airplane is just about to land. And then in the last few seconds of flight, the pilots power up and launch back off into the sky. And I'm sure that's that you would be convinced that's to torment you uh, <laughs> or possibly for them to make extra money. And they do make extra money, but that's not why they do it. Um, and you're going, oh, my gosh, why wouldn't they have landed? Why why, why are we doing this? And, and where are they going to go? And what are they going to do? So I want to talk a little bit about where are they going to go and what are they going to do? Well, the pilots have not have not planned for this either. They were all ready to go in the terminal and get on the uh, hotel courtesy van and go to the hotel and start their layover or go home or whatever. However, have dinner. Have dinner. They are ready to execute that procedure from memory. And I remember I used to make the first two or three call outs in my head in case I had to do it so I wasn't so stunned. And, and I can still remember from my airplane, uh, uh, go around thrust, um, flaps five, positive rate, gear up, uh, out of 400 feet, heading, set missed approach altitude, bang, 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 bang. The other guy's doing that and you're calling it out. And that way the airplane is is uh, has guidance, has lateral guidance, has an altitude it's going for, has everything else. And then you take a deep breath and work out with the controller what you're going to do. However, the performance aspect of that, um, when you get your first uh, jet qualifications, you explain the the numbers and all that. And, and then later on, um, you don't get into the minutia on the ratings because the person who thinks about that is the dispatcher, the guy we talked about that plans flights. And uh, the dispatcher thinks about all kinds of performance limits that the airplane might have to meet en route. Um, where they're taken off, they think about runway field length. They think about the ability to climb on one engine. They think about alternates that the airplane might have to go to close in after takeoff. And they also think about when the airplane gets all the way up to destination, what if they have to go around? And um, Dieter, show the show the airplane on approach. Yeah, and I, I will do that in a second. I, I'm just going to say we're being joined um, live here by Tom, who is currently at 28,000 feet approaching LAX. So um, oh. that's a perfect that, that's a perfect uh, way to bring that in. Uh, right. So, so uh, the, you the, should know that you're in good hands and. Um, do you guys see the image? Yeah, yeah, except I want to see the other one. Oh, the other one. Okay, hold on. Yeah. How about this one? That one's perfect. So there they are. They're just getting ready to land the airplane. And and should they have to go around, even from that altitude, they know how to conduct the procedure. And the dispatcher has, has uh, various sets of limited weights, as I mentioned, Maximum takeoff weight for runway length, maximum um, uh, one engine and operative weights, maximum uh, weights en route. And one of the limiting weights that the dispatcher thinks about is called approach climb limit. Because we don't assume that the airplane will have everything working when it goes around. It has to be a worst case scenario. So the dispatcher will assume right there when they start to go around, that they'll have an engine fire. And the performance has to allow for the airplane to do the go around or missed approach. And we use those terms interchangeably. The go around or missed approach has to be conducted on one engine 
and initiated there with the flaps in the landing position and the landing gear down like it shows in the slide. So it's it's coming out of a very low altitude when it starts that maneuver and the airplane weight uh, must be such that it can meet various single engine uh, performance climb requirements, both of the flaps and the gear down. And then after the flaps and the gear come up on the missed approach, um, it has to it has to meet the single engine uh, the single engine performance requirements. Now, obviously, this airplane is in the air and it's flying and it has speed and energy, so it doesn't have to accelerate much. All it needs is the thrust to go up and to maintain constant speed, and it's burned off. Um, uh, uh, a small, a medium, or a large amount of fuel en route to destination. So now it is it is taking it is climbing back out, even though it's on one engine at a much lighter weight, and is easily able to make uh, those performance limitations. Uh, Dieter, go back to the airplane sitting on the runway. All right, let me. You can find him. There we go. That airplane. We, I picked because he's he's at a threshold of a runway. He's getting ready to take off, and and as we've told you many times on the show before, we we have what we call a balance field length, and a takeoff decision speed, uh, below which we will reject the takeoff, or above which we're perfectly capable of continuing the takeoff, having an engine fire, and climbing out on one engine. But think about it: this airplane has zero energy sitting there, none. It has to generate all of it. From the takeoff thrust and the airplane that that was just about to land it has enough energy to be flying and it is flying right there so it's in a much more advantageous state than the airplane that isn't moving to start with the reason i'm telling you that is because i want you to be rest assured that if you are in an airplane and they do ever execute a go-around a the pilots have practiced it over and over and over and over and and B, the uh, airplane is in a, a very good energy state to be able to be able to make that maneuver um, on one engine or two engines. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. That's okay, me. that was my little flying shtick for the night, and um, I'll just sit here and and take questions or whatever these guys want to oh, throw. Can, yeah. I, can I talk about what I ha happened to me? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Please so, please. so Captain Eric, Captain Eric has all of those uh, statistics, and 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 all the pilots have that just wrote. They just, as he says, they practice it and practice it and practice it. So you can basically say in your sleep, I'm sure. The the Eric, did you did you have to do many or missed approaches or go rounds in your career? Less than five in thirty two years, I'm thinking. Okay. Well, yep. for me, in less than five years of flying, I've already had one. And it was, I want to say, maybe two, two and a half years ago, something like that. And we were coming into, I think it was Grand Junction. And uh, of course, my my aircraft, I fly the regionals. My aircraft, we have two flight attendants. One that sits in the front when we're, when we're all buckled and uh, secure in our jump seats. And one in the front and one in the back. And I was in the back. I was the aft flight attendant. And, and so with my little, with my plane and where I was sitting and the configuration of that particular aircraft, I could see um, kind of across from the last row of passenger seats, I could see out their windows, which I kind of do, you know, it's kind of nice to kind of look out a little bit. Um, and as we're coming in, although I did kind of have my head down in my approved race position for landing, but as we came in, um, and as I kind of peeked over, I'm pretty sure we had three or four molecules of, of rubber on the tires hit the runway. And that's all. And then we powered back up big time. And as we powered back up, you know, I sat back up and was I scared, nervous? No. I, all I said to myself was, well, that was interesting. We're going around. And because that's, you know, that's all you're thinking about. I mean, for me, uh, for the flight attendants. The pilots, of course, Eric and and uh, and his first officer, they they have a million things going on up in the flight deck, and for us in the back, we're just like, oh, that was interesting, and then we have to be prepared 
for the worst case scenario, which doesn't happen, but, but we have to be prepared for it. Anyway, so we powered back up and we went around and we made another approach and we landed just fine and peachy. And I made about another extra dollar or two or three or something just by the extra airtime, which was kind of fun. <laughs> I know. And, uh, so and you have the advocate of go around? <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, I can't remember if that was our final destination for that day. So I don't know if we were late for the hotel van or, or what, but anyway, so we get down and, and, and I will tell you that the passengers, no one was nervous. No one was crying out or anything like that. They were, but I could tell as I looked at them, they were all kind of peeking out, kind of wanting to know what happened. Um, and some of them, and this is an important thing, I think, for everyone to keep in mind, they would like to know, and we certainly we certainly like it when uh, when the pilots, when the captain talks to the rest of the, talks to the passengers about what happened. But you have to understand, they're busy. I mean, in this kind of scenario, talking to us as flight attendants is after they deal with all of the things they have to deal with right then. Talking to the passengers comes after talking to us and letting us know what's going on because we need to know whether or not we have to prepare for um, an emergency landing, emergency de uh, deplaning, uh, expedited deplaning rather. So we have to know as flight attendants what we are expected to do. And But, but that comes after the pilots do all the things that Eric has been uh, talking about. So, so we're not able to let the passengers know until we know, obviously. And so, and, and that occurred. And so they were, as we landed and the seatbelts on came off and people were standing up and um, is that okay? Oh yeah, it is. And it was okay. We landed just fine. Everybody deplaned and come to find out. Um, now, Eric mentioned, you know, if there's a, if there's a problem, I mean, Eric, you probably, I don't know what the reasons were for your missed approaches. But as it turned out, what we found out later, as we were coming into the airport, there was an, an operations truck, an ops truck at the far end of the runway. And realistically, what the captain said that by the time we landed, the truck would have exited the runway and it would not have been a problem. However, Eric can explain it better than I can because I can't. Uh, what the what the FAA and and the requirements are, so that be, because the truck was still crossing the end of the runway, we were not allowed to land. And as it turned out, the driver of the truck, his radio had died, and so the tower ATC, they, the tower was trying to get in touch with the driver to tell him a plane was landing, but his radio was dead and he didn't know. And so that was, there was nothing wrong with the plane, nothing wrong with anything. It's just that, as Eric will explain, it was something that we were prohibited um, from, from accomplishing. So take it, Eric, that's the, my that, it, What she just said, well, she said that reason is the quote unquote normal reason for a go around to have to be executed. There's a vehicle on the runway or there's an airplane crossing the runway that shouldn't have, or we are the approaching airplane either because they were going too fast or the controller brought them in too tight behind the airplane in front of them. Uh, the airplane on the runway had not cleared uh, uh, the runway yet, or they missed the taxiway that the controllers anticipated they were going to use to clear. But the FAA is hard over are not sharing that piece of pavement. Absolutely, positively not. Even if you're positive, positive you're not going to smack them. You can't share it with anybody. So if there's anything on there, then they will instruct you to go around or you have to go around in, until it is clear. And, and I was thinking it's about the same thing that happened to me on my last one was in, I think, Maui. And uh, the airplane missed the normal turn off and and I was just too close to him, uh, and he wasn't going to make the turnoff before I landed. So, and everybody wanted a few more minutes after coming all the way over the ocean anyway. So I'm sure they were deliriously happy. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, but that that was that was why. And that's the normal reason somebody's on somebody's on the runway. 
Um, um, and it's got to be clear before you can land. So there's, so there's nothing wrong with the plane, you know, just to 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 make our passengers feel more secure, our fearful flyers. It, there, there's nothing wrong with the plane at all. It's just, you, yeah. Sorry, it's, go ahead, Dan. You no, know, it's, it's, it's just, it's a, in retrospect, a relatively simple, but a very, very locked in, in uh, stone reason for the reason we, we couldn't land, so. Well, we, um, up here in the, um, in Canada, just a couple of weeks ago, we actually had an Air Canada flight um, from Toronto going to St. John's, Newfoundland, and it was an overnight. Um, and what happened was um, blizzard conditions at the um, Newfoundland airport, and the Air Canada plane actually tried to land three times and okay. couldn't. So the only thing that they could do was fly all the way back to um, Toronto. So, um, you know, sometimes in these, you know, um, uh, wintry conditions and out of an abundance of caution, um, those parameters, you know, so they had to turn around and um, go all the way back home. And, and it's funny because um, what I, I read was that a couple of the passengers were vocal and said, oh, we should have tried another time. And, you know, so I guess, you know, yes, it's obviously inconvenient and you probably had something scheduled and you had to go, but, but there's really very, very clear limits on, you know, what can and should be done. And, and I actually was in a um, go around myself, although I'm not sure that that, that really counts because it was a DC-3 plane in Antarctica, and we were landing on a blue ice field. And um, uh, the vis visibility was such that um, there were, were these snow, like squalls. And um, so we were trying twice and landed the third, landed on the third try. So um, just the visibility was such that you know, we just had to wait until the pilot could see enough of the the blue ice field. Um, but yeah, everything's white. <laughs> um, here's a question that I don't actually have um, or don't know the answer. Um, Katie is asking, can you use a VR headset while a passenger? And that's a very um, timely question because the Apple Vision Pro just came out and. And I've seen all sorts of, um, uh, um, you know, little reviews about that VR headset. Um, but do you guys know, like Diane, what if somebody sits with these weird looking ski goggles uh, <laughs> on, a, on a plane? Can you actually, is there regulation around it? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you can, I mean, you can you know, watch movies, you can listen to music, you can do all kinds of things um, on your uh, own devices. Um, as long as you're not in airplane mode, as long as whatever device you're using is not able to, to send and to receive um, that kind of transmission. To my knowledge, uh, I, I hadn't, um, hadn't even really thought about it. I've seen a review of someone on the plane, so I'm gonna say it's not a handheld device because it's right. actually it's right. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, as so, long as again, as long as the um, as long as the device is not in in a transmission in a transmitting mode, uh -huh. uh, such as a cell phone, then I would think it'd be okay. I haven't seen the airlines address it at all <laughs> yet either, but but I would think they would, especially for takeoff and landing phase. In case there's an emergency, in case you had to evacuate, which is highly remote, but if the the guy or gal on the on the VR goggles is engaged in an unbelievable mountain biking race, they're they're going to be totally removed from <laughs> from what's actually going on around them. And and I would think that the that the airlines would put their foot down on it, but but I haven't seen anything on. And guidance in that regard yet either. Well, I mean, the Apple Vision 
I think it's about three and a half thousand. So I don't think we'll see them pop up quite as quickly. Um, but but it's a good point. And, and Katie makes the point why well, it would be a great distraction. And I'm going to say yes. And even though we keep saying how safe flying is, but you do need to be able to know what's going on in those really two critical phases of flight, which is takeoff and landing. And at the very least, you need to be able to um, hear or see, you know, the flight attendants if they need to get um, people's attention for whatever reason. So I, I would think that, um, that that would be where the airlines say, you know what, use it all you want, except for takeoff and landing or something like that. And that, that's a very, it's a, that's a wonderful point that you brought up as far as attention and the two critical phases of flight, because statistically that's when, if anything is gonna go wrong, that's when they go wrong. And for, for us, for flight attendants, that's kind of um, a real nagging concern that, that we have that unfortunately or fortunately, the airlines themselves, it may be a policy decision. There's nothing that is um, that I'm aware of at all, as far as an FAA requirement with regard to earbuds or or any kinds of we we're talking about the VR goggles, uh, the the restrictions for the exit row passengers are, are very standard across the board with the airlines. Uh, but as far as the attention going, that that irks me and and all of my my peers with regard to passengers as soon as they got on the plane or even as they're boarding they have headphones and they have earbuds they have everything and and it's it goes beyond it goes beyond whether you say would you like uh, diet coke regular coke ginger ale something and they're in la la land they really are and then and then of course you get yelled at because you go by them because they didn't hear you and say oh you didn't get me anything so, so on that, that's a real simple end of the scale, but at the other end of the scale, I've had to deal with passengers in the exit row mm -hmm. who have earbuds in and they have, they have, they're, they're watching something or listening to music on their phone. And we're required by the FAA to give a specific briefings. I mean, verbatim, we have to do it verbatim. Have you reviewed the passenger safety card? I still willing and able to assist in the event of an emergency. I need a verbal yes or no. I mean, we have to, every single airline, every single flight attendant has to say the very same thing. And, and I've had to stand there sometimes looking at a passenger who is oblivious to the fact we have to, I'm asking this question. So to add, Insult to injury, I mean, that drive me over the edge. Um, I, I don't know. I would hope that my airline would have a policy with regard to that, but well, I'll tell you what. Well, um, I'm sure it'll come up sooner or later. Um, yeah, um, and, and Katie, you're not the only one. Um, claustrophobia <laughs> or clitrophobia, as we call it here, because that tends to be more the focus um, of fearful flyers. That is uh, an issue, and and I, and I hear you. The, ultimately, if you can support yourself with these um, VR devices, um, absolutely go ahead and do it. Um, and again, you do want to be uh, aware enough of what's going on around you. And, and Sharon kind of speaks to your point here, Diane. It always drives me crazy when people don't listen to the instructions from the flight attendant. It's a matter of respect. When someone is speaking to you, you should listen. I get it all the time. I'm a high school principal. Oh, I, God. You know what? I, I, and I couldn't agree more because at the very least, here, here's the real, we, we were joking all the time how, how safe it is. Um, but it is a matter of respect. And, and you guys, um, speaking to you, Dan, you, you are there really for our safety and, and not everybody flies a whole lot so um there is a matter of respect involved you know in 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 terms of you know just allowing you to do your job and 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 also feel feel good about the fact that um you care about your job and i'm gonna you know be the benefit of you doing your job really well so um i've had i had 
and 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 respect and that's true it really is true i mean we do have the sense that some people think that we're just up there um pouring coke and 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 certainly that's what they see us do percentage of the flight that's what we're doing most of the time but i just just to you know, a, a cute little vignette we have um like most airplanes the aisle seats, the armrests come up, you know, but there's a little button or a lever and it depends on the plane. And even on my planes, I have a couple different kinds. And I was, uh, was walking down the aisle one time and this this woman, these two ladies were sitting together and she was trying very hard to get the armrest up and was not able to. And I said, oh, ma'am, just a minute, let me help you with that. And I ding, ding, ding. And I put the armrest up and she looked at me, she said, oh my goodness, that's so wonderful of you. And I looked at her and I said, and you just thought I was here to keep you alive. And I said that loud enough because it's not just those ladies, but it's everybody sitting around to remind them we're there to keep you alive. I mean, if I get just soda and a Biscoff cookie, I'm thrilled. And I answer any question you have, I'm thrilled. But that's why we're on the plane is to keep to keep you alive. Um. And I just want to, John has a question that I'm also, I don't think there's a way for the crew or anybody to check whether or not um, someone is in airplane mode or not. Um, but I'm also going to say ultimately, because that's the other side here, the fear is that somehow it could interfere with the plane. So Eric, I, I do want you to quickly speak to so for those people who are rebels don't care forget about it whatever it doesn't actually make the flight any more unsafe correct correct we were we the airlines were worried about that initially but there is not even close enough of the transmitting power in the phones to cause any kind of navigation and inter interference the worries with the cell with the cell stuff is having transmitting towers near the airports and particularly near the facilities transmitting uh, uh, instrument landing signals to the airplane on the ground. We're not concerned with those in the air um, um, because they just don't have the they don't have the power to disrupt stuff. And my my favorite fifteen second story was a. a older guy, probably my age, saw a teenager who wouldn't turn off his phone in the early days of this. And the older guy became so upset he got out of his seat and beat the teenager to paste. And and it's probably never a bad time to not get out of your seat and beat a teenager to paste. But his phone was not going to cause any navigational signal interruption. <laughs> with the, but, but the elderly gentleman, who, as I said, was probably my age, and may still be in jail, was very concerned about that possibility. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we, it's, it's one of those things you just have to do. And you're right. There's, there's short, short of listening to conversations as you're going up and down the aisle. Per, and personally, with regard to the, the, the use of the cell phone, one of the things I think most of us as flight attendants are, are, are worried about is at some point, if they do allow that, is having having six, I have maybe 65 people on my plane, having 65 phone conversations going on at once. It's bad enough as it is sometimes with, with the distractions. But can you imagine, it's, can you imagine someone yelling on the phone to a, a teenager, did you clean your room and have that magnified by 150 other people with all of the permutations of conversations? I, you know, I just sit in the back and go in the lab for the rest of the flight. I don't know. It'd be terrible. I saw a great um, a great thing on Kickstarter um, a while back. It's a personal um, muffled device, literally. <laughs> so, that's, it's so you can speak on your phone in public places and it's quiet. So somebody already thought about that. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a muffled. Yeah, it looks like a muffled. It didn't work either. I'm just saying. Well, the, and the main concern from you, the user just thinking about yourself not the safety aspect is and if you can plug the plane uh, the cell phone in the plane well great but if you can't and you leave the thing in air in in normal mode as the airplane flies along at eight miles per minute it keeps trying to attach 
unsuccessfully to towers and skips and skips and skips and skips and tries to attach and you'll show up at wherever you're going and your battery will be dead. Yeah. Very, very dead. Very true. Hey, I want to end this um with um a little shout out and uh, some congratulations to Erin. Um, Erin said she just got back yesterday and she didn't really prefer that both of her flights were bumpy. Um, I think she says too bumpy. Um, but she did say that uh, the captain on her last flight was really amazing. Um, so he would actually have even, you know, the flight attendants. I guess she she followed what we always um, teach you guys, and that is introduce yourself to the flight attendants and to the captain if possible. Let them know you're a human being. And um, you know, more importantly, you get to know that they're human beings and that they care not just about you, but their own health and their own well-being and their families. And they want to go home and see them. And um, she said that uh, the flight attendants uh, checked on her, she, she uh, how she was doing. Um, and I guess he even made an announcement that... Uh, uh, he said, we have a fearful flyer on board, and I also want to let everyone know that we'll be hitting lots of bumps, so we're asked the flight attendants to sit down early, and he also said, I just wanted to let the fearful flyer know, um, mm -hmm. and everything will be okay. So that's that's kind of cool, and that's what happens when you make the effort, you have the courage um, to ask to pre-board, um, you know, um, under the Americans with Disability Act, you have that right as a fearful flyer. And um, it's very cool. So thanks for sharing that, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Um, any last words? Yeah, tell just remind everybody about this this weekend, about Saturday in uh, Burbank. Oh, the, um, oh, in that that will be March, right? Um, so that is um, now oh, you this weekend. Oh, no, this weekend. This Saturday. This Saturday. We're going to right. Bur we're going to Burbank to Saturday. Oh, right. There's um yes. not then, sure if um if you are in the LA area or you can make it to the LA area on um, February twenty-fourth, so this Saturday, mm -hmm. um, we have our flight with Captain Ron, Captain Eric, and flight attendant Diane going from Burbank to San uh, where Sac is it now? Sacramento. Sacramento. Um, I was thinking San Diego, but no, Sacramento. And so if um, I did see that Southwest is still uh, having fair sales. So if you're thinking about it, check it out. I'll put the link in the comments. Um, I know there's a few uh, of our regulars that are flying, like Tracy and... Uh, Gary and um, Oliver and I'm not sure I'm not sure who else is um, gonna fly so please forgive me if I didn't <laughs> mention you by name but um, I will put a link in and then in the beginning of March we have our free cleared um, cleared for takeoff 101 class the in-person class in Phoenix at the airport and for those of you who are not local to Phoenix, um, the Sunday after, we uh, have Captain Ron do the whole thing uh, online. So, um, <laughs> and Sharon said, have a fun flight. We'd love to fly with you if you're on the East Coast in the spring or summer. Well, um, we'll, um, we'll see what, uh, what Captain Ron can come up with here. Uh, maybe we can we can have a a flight out of Boston again or something like that. Um, but uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll email if that is the case or post it in the Birds of a Feather group as well. All right, Diane, Eric, thank you so much for being on here tonight and sharing your wisdom and your insights. And um, I want to invite everybody to tune in next week at 6.30 for another show. Um, any last words? No, I think we covered pretty well. 
No, but and nobody really, nobody really hammered us a trick question, so that's good. No, no trick questions. So thank you for that. You didn't and even have yes. to pick anything up. Oh, it was boring. <laughs> Jim, Jim Duke gave us a night off. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Jim's probably cruising around somewhere. Yeah. Slapping right, off, so, I'm telling you. Yeah, you gotta no, watch out. No connection. No. All right. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Bye.